Hi guys, I'm Angelo. Uh, I think most of you know me by now. Um, <coughs> so, uh, apologies in advance, the talk was a little bit last minute. Uh, it's going to be a lot of live coding. Uh, we're going to release an open source project together today. I don't know that it'll do a whole lot, but we're going to do it anyways. Um, and uh, we're going to look at what, uh, what's out there that we can take advantage of uh, because we're releasing an open source project uh, for free. Free as in <laughs> free services as in free beer and free software as in free speech. You guys have all heard that line before, I'm sure, by now. Uh, just for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Angel Genovese. Uh, I'm a software developer working almost entirely in startups over the course of my career, uh, about, well, over 15 years now. Uh, mostly on the JVM, a lot of Scala in the last five years or so. Uh, and I'm also the author of a couple of small open source projects. So. All right, so as a starting point, uh, we want to have a small Java library, and uh, we've decided we want to share it with the world, right? So we're going to open source it. So I promised live coding. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you, s you say that jokingly. Uh, <laughs> no, I say it half jokingly. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not going to use an IDE because there's no point for the stuff we're doing here today. Um, all right. Sorry. Let me get rid of that. All right. Apparently. No dice. Oh well. All right. Um. So we'll call it Hello T Jug. Okay, so we're going to have a Maven build file. I'm not going to really be getting a lot into details about Maven, so this is going to be a fairly basic one. Um, and I'm just going to kill, oops. So I'm going to leave us a JUnit test, uh, test support and Just make that. Can everybody read that reasonably well? Yeah? OK. So this is about as simple as you can get for uh, a Maven build file. Nothing, nothing fancy, nothing really crazy, just support from a test library. Um, and So let's have a look at our super spectacular library that's Hello World, because it's not the point. Um, and our library w even has tests, or a test, that proves that true is true, because that matters for some reason. Um, because no one's ever read code that had tests that just, never mind. Um, <laughs> OK, so now I've got, I've got a, a project. So now what? Well, if I want to share this with the world, the first thing I want to do is share the code. right? And generally, I want to share the code using a version control system because people want to be able to see the history. I want to be able to track the history and not go insane. Um, and so. 
Sorry, I'm going to be jumping back and forth here a little bit. Uh, so version control. We've got a few options. Nowadays, I'm going to say that Git is more or less the default choice. Uh, is anyone here not using Git? No? OK, good. Um, and for open source projects, at this point, I would say that GitHub is almost invariably the default choice for a hosting provider. Um, sorry? I don't, I don't have a problem with it, but you know, hey, if you do, there's Bitbucket and GitLab. Uh, we actually use Bitbucket uh, in our, for our corporate code. Um, we've seriously considered switching over, but it's there, it works. Uh, you can use GitLab, and they'll promise to lose your data for you. I mean, they promise they won't lose your data again, uh, probably. <laughs> um, but again, they work. Uh, they each have some interesting pricing options, but those, they all have a pricing option, which is completely free for open source projects. Obviously, the requirement being that your code be open sourced, i.e. anybody can get onto the, your project on their hosting provider. Uh, so. Uh, we're going to go with GitHub for this uh, demonstration. Like I said, it's generally the default choice, so why not? Um, I'm not going to walk you through creating a, a new GitHub account because, oops. Sorry? Exactly. <laughs> I, have, I actually have projects on GitLab. They're just projects I don't care about, so it doesn't matter if they delete them on me. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're going to create a new repository. We're going to call it hello tjug. Uh, I'm not going to bother giving it any of this stuff. Um, now, you can and probably should do this. Uh, make sure you have a README. I'm going to go against that advice because no one's ever going to use this project, but have a README and especially have a license. Like, pick one. If you're doing Java, I would suggest really consider the Apache license because everybody's using it. And please don't write your own. <laughs> um, <laughs> for God's sakes, please don't write your own. There are enough of them. All right, so that gives us a, uh, uh, a URL for this, uh, uh, for this Git repo. So we're going to do a git init, git uh, dot git. Uh, Hang on. Add, uh, and we'll call this origin and we'll give it a URL. Get push. And great, we've pushed some code. So we've got an open source library right now, right? We're done. Yay. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so here's what you get, right? You've got the, the current state of your project. You can look at the history of your commits, whatever branches are out there. Uh, this isn't going to be a tutorial on how Git works. Uh, you know, if you want to know more about how Git works and you're willing to buy me enough beer to make me do that, then you know, we can negotiate something. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing I will point out is that Git gives you a few things above and beyond uh, the, the actual core, like, Git uh, project. And in fact, above and beyond source code control. Uh, it gives you issue tracking. It's not nearly as fancy as Jira. Personally, I think that's a good thing because I don't think Jira's fanciness is a good thing, but it's not. Um, but it does give you issue tracking, which can be a real boon for not having to find somewhere else to put it. It gives you a wiki for somewhere to put, you know, sort of internal documentation. Um, so that, you know, it gives you some, some starting stuff, right? Um, again, I'm not going to give a tutorial here on how wikis work or how issue tracking works. They're there. You, you know, you should take advantage of them if you're doing this sort of thing. 
Um, but now I've got a build, or uh, now I've got a, uh, a project, and oh, you know, something I haven't done. Does it work? Wow. <laughs> Let's find out. It's entirely possible I screwed something up here. Uh, oh, hey, perfect. Success. Okay. Um, so, now what? Well, we probably don't want to rely on me building the thing locally every time, especially since I want to know if, presumably when everybody else helps uh, improve this wonderful library because it's so incredibly useful, um, I want to know that things worked like when they build them or when they commit new changes, right? So I want the build to happen somewhere else, right? Continuous integration. Well, there's a few out there and they're free for open source projects. And as a bonus, most of them in integrate incredibly well to GitHub. By the way, if you're choosing your hosting provider for, uh, uh, for your source code repository, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, Keep in mind, some of them are more, have more integrations available than others. So have a look around, see what you want to use, make sure the, the other things you want to use work with the, uh, the version control you, you're going to choose. GitHub pretty much works with everything. So that's a bonus. Um, so we're going to, for this project, we're going to use CircleCI. Um, mostly because that's the one I've been mucking around with lately. Uh, Travis is probably more common for open source projects as the choice. I would say that from my point of view, there isn't a whole lot of differentiation between these. Um, there's a lot of difference in price. So if you're doing this for a commercial team, as a side note, all of these services are available to you as a commercial team. You just have to pay for them. Um, from my understanding, Travis's pricing can be problematic for some commercial teams. So when you're looking at this in particular, keep an eye on what it costs because that could be problematic for you, right? Um, I've worked with Travis uh, on, on some of my own open source projects. It's great, absolutely works. I haven't worked with CodeShip personally and I know that there are a ton more out there. Uh, if you have a favorite, I mean, let people know. Um, so let's... Uh, Let's see how circle works. So I'm going to go circleci.com. I'm going to go to the app. You'll note I already have accounts at most of these places. Um, the most of them will use your GitHub credentials for your logins. You don't have to create, go creating a lot of accounts. You just keep using your GitHub account, which is kind of nice. Um, but. I'm going to go add a project, and oh, hey, we have Hello Jug. that's one of our projects. We're going to say building it on Linux is fine, because I don't want to pay for it. Um, it's going to be a Maven project. This doesn't actually matter, it just gives different instructions. And it's going to tell us to create a CircleCI directory and add a config. Well, uh, I'm going to cheat. Let's have a look here. So, uh, get rid of a few things here. Sorry, I know I'm kind of working backwards. We have this already finished thing, um, but I will go over it, I promise. Okay, so Circle CI is set up as you you give it a set of jobs which are instructions for different sort of overall steps in your build process. Each job is run on a Docker machine, like a Docker image, 
Um, and depending on how their dependencies, interdependencies work, they can run some of them in parallel for you, which is kind of nice. Um, in this case, we're going to say, okay, we've got a Docker-based machine. Uh, we're going to give it a, you know, what's the working directory. We want to check out the source code. You can cache, like your, you know, Maven will download the universe every time, the first time you build something with it. Well, since it's a fresh Docker machine, you can cache the universe that got downloaded and not have to do it again, so your builds are a little bit faster. Um, we're gonna, uh, so Maven dependency go offline, we'll fetch all of the, the things that you depend on. We're gonna save the cache, and then we're gonna run the tests. Uh, and we're gonna save some test results in the result of our Circle CI build, okay? Um, and that's it. Uh, actually, we don't even need this stuff. Okay, and then you give it a workflow, which is how do these jobs, these sort of o overarching steps, interact with one another? So if you had like test as a separate step because your tests can be run on a bunch of different machines, um, you would you would have that here and say that tests depend on the build having finished, right? You might deploy to your production environment and that would depend on the, the tests having passed, et cetera. So you can lay all that out here. Their documentation is not fantastic, but not too bad. Uh, Udesh has been doing a lot of work with it lately and you know it, it's working out reasonably well. Um, so this should work, okay. <laughs> Now you'll note I added that file to the project and that's how I would say most of the kind of current generation of build tools works. The description of your build is part of the project and so that way if the steps for building your software change over time, the, those steps are always recorded along with the software version that needs them. So I uh, personally prefer that, some people don't, that's okay. Uh, so let's have a look. So, oh, we got target here. So let's uh, good, do more. Dot. Commit. Gen. Try to get. Working. Push. Okay, so it says set up, set that up, and then uh, start building. So let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got a running build. Oh, that's a workflow. Here we are. And it's giving us the different steps that we had. And you can come in here and look at the output for them. So it's just, you know, the, the output, the log of the output is here. Maybe that was a bad choice, but <laughs> anyways. <laughs> you get the idea. And eventually we can see the build went green, so we had a successful build. Woohoo. Um, all right, so now we've got a build. We're done, right? No? Okay. It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> worth a shot. Uh, okay. Um, so we've got a build. Well, what else do we want? Well, one thing we might want is to be able to talk about how much of the code is being tested or how well is the code being tested. Now, all of the caveats that go with that statement apply here. Uh, Code coverage doesn't necessarily, or test coverage doesn't necessarily equate to test quality, et cetera. But it can be an interesting metric to keep track of. Um, and it's there and it's free, so let's try it out anyways, okay? Um, and so we're gonna try the coveralls uh, stuff for it. And so, uh,
And so doing coveralls, actually, let's go to the web page first. Oops, wrong. What happened here? I closed, oh, that's why. Jumped into another window. All right, uh, so coveralls. So there's, again, there's a couple of different options out there for, for, this, uh, for this type of service. Coveralls is one. Uh, CodeCov.io is another uh, that I've used personally. Uh, I think there's a few more out there. Some of the ones that we'll talk about next, Static Code Analysis Tools, will also talk about code coverage on their uh, site. So if you want to look at those, that's another option. Uh, but for now, we'll use coveralls. They're all pretty similar um, in how they work. So we're going to go to the coveralls website. We're going to add a repo. Huh. It has not figured out that things are here. Oh, sync repos. Let's see if that helps. Ah, there we are. So we're going to turn on hello tjug and go have a look at it. And so one thing I'll warn you about coveralls is that their documentation very much assumes that you're using Travis, which is what it is. We're not, but that's OK. We'll see how hard or easy it is to deal with this anyways. Um, and a lot of their documentation sort of assumes that you're using Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you're using Ruby, then tests are a much bigger deal since you don't have the compiler helping you at all. Um, but, you know, we're here. Um, they do have documentation for other cases. Um, the, the Java case is actually a third party library. Um, it's not r produced by Coveralls, it's some open source library that someone's produced that is a Maven plugin that will take the, the uh, coverage results from either of two existing code coverage measurement uh, tools for, Ma for Java, Cobertura or Jococo, um, and it'll upload them to coveralls for you. Um, and I'll save us the uh, heartache of going through all of that documentation, because it's a pain in the ass. Um, oh, I need. All right, oops. Let's just run that again. Okay, the build still succeeds. Um, okay, so that works. And we also need to change, so there's some commands we need to run to get coverage results. Um, going to be this guy here. Okay, so we're going to run verify, which will run the test for us. Uh, and then we're going to run Cobertura. That's the one I picked. They're both really easy to set up. There are some really, really fine grained differences between them. And if you really care about statement coverage versus branch coverage, et cetera, fill your boots. You said both, so what's the other one? Uh, Jococo. Um, they are almost identical to set up. Basically add a little section to your palm that you copy and paste it off of their website. Done. Like it's not, uh, it's not particularly difficult to get that going. And then there's this coveralls report, which is the other, um, uh, the other plugin, the one that I mentioned that's open source. Oops. And I just realized 
Oh, OK. Now, this is, uh, so we have a bit of a problem here in that we have a secret that we're, we're being given to represent this project, right? Coveralls is saying, when you tell us the test results, you need to also tell us this chunk of gobbledygook. But we don't want that chunk of gobbledygook in the public part of the code, because otherwise, Tom, because he's a jerk sometimes, could go, <laughs> could go and, and <laughs> as. <laughs> yeah. We'll be hearing from his <laughs> union. Yeah. Um, he could come along and, and <laughs> upload faked results to coveralls <laughs> if he knows this string, right? Um, and so we don't want that to be public. Similarly, like, you know, database access credentials, if those are important for your, your build or, you know, access to your, your binary uh, repo, like the, your Maven stuff, anything like that, you, you can't go checking those into source code. Like, that, that doesn't fly. Um, luckily, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> correct. You can, but shouldn't. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> luckily, <laughs> um, that's fine. Cause QR codes are useless, so that's <laughs> not. <laughs> so luckily, um, uh, Circle gives you a way to set these things so that you can keep them secret. Okay. Uh, and so what we're going to do is find hello tjug, and we're going to configure it. And we're going to say we want to set environment variables, and we want to add a variable. And I'm going to, oop, wrong thing. So let me go and grab, so this, I'm going to grab the secret string that, oh no, all of you know now, we're, we're oh. that's it, it's all over. Oh, no. you, you, Tom knows that it's <laughs> And so in here, you can see I've done this, uh, this syntax in Maven will use the, val the value from an environment variable uh, to fill in that bit. Um, and so I'm going to set that environment variable. I'm going to add it. And now we can see we've got it. And it's some value. You can only see the last four characters now. So even if someone else has access, they won't be able to read the full credential, which is kind of nice. But it's there. Um, OK, and I think port push. Let's see if that works. So we're going to go to builds. OK, and we can see it's building. I don't think the caching thing works very well. I find it, it <laughs> still downloads the damn stuff every goddamn time, but mm -hmm. is what it is. Uh, and so, OK, we're, we're generating our coveralls report. And everything passed. So let's go have a look at coveralls and see, well, oh, hey, we've got results of some sort. Um, <laughs> and our coverage is zero. <laughs> Right? Looks good, ship it. <laughs> <laughs> Why, is that a problem? <laughs> I don't see any errors. Um, and so, let's go look. I mean, but we had a test, right? Um, so, this is one of the reasons why code coverage is kind of a, an interesting thing to look at, because when you have parts of the code that are, are not covered that you thought were, you can go look at what's happening, right? And so we can see that actually none of the production code is ever executed by any of our tests because we're that good at writing tests, apparently. Um, but that's there, and you can see that and say, you know, oh shit, there's that really important method, and we actually didn't cover it in any of the tests. I thought it was being executed. This gives you some info. And it lets you kind of explore what is and isn't being executed, which is good information to have. Um, again, I encourage you, if you're ever looking at this, either in open source or in a professional setting, to take the numbers with a grain of salt and use it more as a, uh, a way to drive investigation into what's happening as opposed to a, you know, thou shalt hit 
90% code coverage, otherwise you're fired or something. Please don't do that. It's not productive. Um, OK. So let's see where we are here. So great, we've got test coverage reports. We now know that we suck at writing tests. We probably want to know whether or not we suck at writing code, too, because you know, that's important. So some people might be familiar with some static analysis tools that are out there. There's things like uh, check style, which is you know checks for, for stylistic things about Java. Uh, you might find find bugs or, or PMD. Uh, there's a whole bunch of others. There's also things like SonarCube that are out there that kind of do a whole bunch of these types of, of checks. The problem with all of those solutions is you have to host them yourself. And we're trying to avoid doing that because we're an open source project and we have no money. Um, so it turns out some people have produced these things as a service because as a service is popular now. Um, and so we're going to try one of them, which is Codacy. Uh, there's, again, a few others, and there's probably even more out there. If you use one and you have a favorite, let people know. Um, so let's, uh, let's give Codacy a shot. And so we're going to go to codacy.com. Add a project. And we're going to add hello tjug. Again, free for use with public repositories. Oh. Okay. Codacy as well? Cool. Oh, neat. So, yeah, that's another thing. A lot of these places are like, they have some sort of additionally free plan for either a limited number of repositories or a limited number of users, etc. So, if you're at a small company, it might be worth looking at what you can get for cheap or free. Um, so this can take a little while the first time. So what I'm going to do is show you. Uh, I know you'll all be, be shocked and dismayed, but I, I've got another project that I just did yesterday that's the same. <laughs> um, so I'll sh yeah, I know. It's all that code yeah. twice. Yes. <laughs> um, it's like the TV shows where they cook, right? And now one from the oven. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, our project has uh, some issues. Uh, it's their code style issues in this case. So, let's have a look at what sort of thing this identified in Hello World. The other one didn't. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, actually. <laughs> so, you shouldn't assert true, true, because that doesn't do anything. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'll, we'll get to the shell script, but yeah, that actually that was news to me. I, That's cool. I, you know, so it's saying don't use backticks. Who'd have thunk it? I didn't know that that wasn't uh, like that. That was a negative thing nowadays. Apparently, when shell scripting, if you're doing a callout, use the dollar sign with the brackets instead of the backticks. Okay. Um, how are we doing for? Oh, we got lots of time. Okay, so. Uh, the, th the interesting thing about Codacy is it integrates directly to GitHub, uh, so it adds a post commit hook, so you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to change your project. You don't have to do anything other than show up and say, yes, you're allowed to do this, and go. You're done. You are obviously giving them access to your source code, so if you're doing sensitive things, don't. But this talk is all about open source software, so it doesn't really matter. Um, all right. Get rid of that, because uh, I keep clicking on it by accident. And all right. So now we're done, right? We know our code sucks. It's out there. Unfortunately, people are used to being able to go into Maven and say, I want to use this thing with just a little bit of XML without having to build it themselves, right? And right now, you can't do that, like at least not with what we've done. So we probably want binary artifact hosting, OK? Uh, and again, there's a bunch of options. And the one option that if you're doing a real open source project that you really want people to use, obviously this isn't one of them, um, you're going to end up having to deal with Sonotype because Sonotype are the, the guys who host Maven Central. So if you want your, your 
project to be able to be used as a dependency with nothing but a dependency section, you got to deal with them. And I will tell you from personal experience that that can be somewhat painful. They, all code has to be signed, all code has to follow certain, like there's a bunch of structural things that they need. Your, your, your group ID has to match a certain thing, et cetera. So there's, you know, and there's a manual approval process. So you go into their JIRA, yes, really JIRA, create a ticket asking for them to give you an account. And then you wait a week and they get back to you and so on. Obviously, I don't have a week to show you guys this, so we're not going to do it that way. Um, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> Afraid not. Huh? You could do that, yeah. Yeah, you definitely could do that. Uh, so you, uh, the question was, why, why not just host it in GitHub? You can definitely do it that way. Uh, there's, uh, there's actually a few projects out there for like Jekyll-style projects where you can deploy back to GitHub uh, to the like website, uh, whatever branch that, that they give you for every project. Um, you absolutely could do that. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go with Bintray just again because I've used them before and they're easy. Um, so the one, uh, so the reason I chose Bintray out of these examples is that they don't actually have a manual approval step for anything. Yay. Um, the one downside to Bintray compared to at least Sonotype, I don't know about the other two, I've never used them, is that Bintray will not host snapshot releases. So they only host a full release. You can't have snapshot in the version number, and you can't overwrite a release that's already there, basically. They just won't do it. Uh, that's, from their point of view, that's not what their service is for. Suck it up is essentially their response. Um, they're giving it to you for free, so you know they're calling the shots. Um, so this gets a little more complicated than previous. So what we're going to do, uh, so we need, in Maven, if we want to if we want to deploy somewhere, we need a distribution management section. Oops. So we're going to come in here and add one. Okay, and we're going to say it's bin tray, and it's got this is the the URL for it. Um, actually, why don't I go to bin tray and show you guys? Okay, so the way bin tray works is you uh, oh, that's. Why is this taking me to there? Okay. There we are. Okay. So in Bintray, you add a repository. They they support different types of binary hosting, not just Maven, but they do some of the others. Like I think they've got npm and Gradle. whatever. Uh, Gradle I think uses the Maven ones, don't they? I think so. Uh, but some of the other languages, so like uh, the pip style, like the Python stuff and whatever. I don't know. Regardless, they, they support Maven, which is what's important in our case. Um, so I have a Maven, so you create a repository, and then you create what they call a package, which is kind of a top-level organizational thing for uh, a set of uh, binaries that are related somehow. So you can imagine if you were releasing Apache Commons, well, there's a whole bunch of different Apache Commons things you would have a, an Apache Commons package that you put everything under. Um, so I've got Hello Tjug set up here. Is that for access or do? Um, yeah, and there's some some of the steps that you like. You're expected to kind of release them together, sort of thing. Which in this case we're not going to do, but that's okay. Um, but uh, yeah. So uh, oh, actually, you know what? Let's. Let's go back one. We're going to delete this package. Actually, it's in there. Uh, edit. So let's wipe it out. So I sort of lied. I said you can't like replace because you can't do snapshots. Well, 
You can always delete the entire package, recreate it, and upload it again. They don't stop you, but uh, <laughs> so we'll create uh, <laughs> we'll create Hello Tjug again. They're only free for open source, so you have to pick which licenses they're under. Uh, so we'll say the Apache 2 license, uh, and there we are. Okay, so we're we've created our package. Um, Where'd it go? Okay, maybe we didn't create our package. Hang on. There we are. Okay. So we've created our package, and uh, we have no versions in it yet. Great. Uh, and it's given us, you know, it's recorded the version control location because again these guys are a little stricter in that you have to tell them where it's open source well where is the source because we're hosting binary stuff so you need to at least tell us where the source is so that we can point people to it for for their own use um, so over here we've said okay this is the this is the location this is their API like how you distribute it accepts the maven style API you give it the, the appropriate URL. Um, so that's great. And And then we need a, again, the Maven thing, we need a, a settings file for Maven to tell it what the username and password are. Again, I don't want to check this in. So what I'm going to do instead is just use them from the environment. So I'm going to add these two username and API token. Um, so I'm going to come back here. Uh, oh, wrong one. Oh, I guess I closed it. All right, uh, CI, go to the app. Go here. So one neat thing about uh, Circle's environment variable stuff is that you can copy environment variables from a different project that you have access to. So you don't necessarily need to know their values. You can just copy them over without, like, sort of blindly. Uh, and so I'm going to copy over from here. Uh, and I'm going to copy the bin tray stuff. I'm not going to co copy coveralls because that one's per repository, so it's different. Um, OK. And if we go here, let's just double check that they're there. And there we are. We have an API token in the username. Now. We have a problem, though, right? Which is, bin tray will only host release versions, so we can't. It's not a snapshot, which means we can't upload the same version over and over again. We probably don't want to force everyone who commits to increment the version number every time they commit, because that would get kind of ridiculous. And we don't actually want to do a release for every commit. That's just silly. So what do we do? Um, now, there are a bunch of solutions to this, right? You could decide that you're going to manually build your releases and you're going to push them yourself. That, that's a valid, if somewhat not nice, process. But you could do it. Um, something that we do uh, is we use tags. So one of the nice things about Circle is that you, it triggers a build not only when you do a commit, but also when you add a tag. And so what we do is look for a tag with a specific pattern to the name of the tag. We pull a version number out of that name, and that becomes the version number for a release that we deploy. 
So I'll show you how we do that. Uh, again, there are lots of other solutions to this problem. This one happens to be the one that we've fallen on. Uh, if people have other ideas, love to hear them. Um, I'll just cat that file so you guys can have a quick look at it. This is the uh, the shell script that the other uh, that the co static code analysis was complaining about. Uh, and so basically, this one's set up for multi-module project if it's necessary. But it goes and it finds anywhere where you have a version number that's just local snapshot and replaces it with the version number that from the tag. So if you create a tag that's release dash something, it'll use the something as the, the version number for a release. Again, this is what we've done. I, I am not saying this is the only way to do it. I'm not even saying this is a particularly good way to do it. But it works for us. And if it works for you, then great. You, you use back ticks, Angelo. God. <laughs> I'm, I'm clear, <laughs> clearly, I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, OK, and then I'm going to. You know what, let's just copy it over. TJG product, oops, what the heck happened there? Uh, dot circle config to here. OK, so let's have a look at what, what does it take to do this? Well, I mentioned that. Uh, you can have multiple jobs, right? Multiple sort of overarching steps in your build process. Um, in order to have certain steps execute only on certain branches or tags, uh, you have to, that has to be a job. That's the, d the level at which you can control that. And so we're, we're going to add another job here, and that's going to be a deployment job, OK? Um, there's some Circle CI stuff I mentioned. You have to. Like it runs on a separate Docker image. So you actually have to do some of this, like persist it to this workspace and then pull it back down again so that you can keep your actual code available to the different jobs or the build product or whatever. So that's, you know, there's some changes there. All of this is an open source project, obviously. So you're welcome to have a look and use what you like. If you have questions, come find me after. Um, but uh, very similar setup. We're going to run that set version script. OK. And then we're going to do create a jar file, and we're going to deploy it. OK. And this is where it gets a little bit interesting. What we're saying is we're going to run deploy. OK. The deploy has to happen after a build happens. Otherwise, we don't have anything to deploy. Um, and it should only happen when there's a tag that matches this regular expression. And it shouldn't matter what branch that tag is on. Um, I haven't actually tried to make it matter. Like, so I, I, I've never tested trying to make it so you can only have, it has to have a tag, and the tag has to be on master, for example. Um, I have no idea if that works, but if you try it and it does or doesn't, let me know. Um, so we'll do that. And we'll do a git status. So git add all of that, git commit, add uh, bin tray and release support, git push. Okay, so let's go have a look at here. So first things first. It's running, right? And we'll let it finish. But note, I haven't done a release yet. So this isn't even going to try to talk to Bintray yet, right? Because that part of the process is part of a workflow that only gets triggered if we have a tag. And we don't have a tag yet. So we'll let it do its thing, download the universe. Yeah. 
And so there's that cache thing is supposed to do this, and I think there's just a bug in something I've done. No, the cache is supposed to persist, is supposed to be attached to your build, not to the individual container. So it's supposed to like be used from build to build. I think I've just got a bug in the way I've set it up. Uh, it uses a uh, checksum of your POM file to decide which cache to use. And so it's supposed to only refresh the cache if your POM changes, which makes sense for dependencies. Um, but I don't know, I, uh, I haven't dug into why it's not working here. I'm pretty sure it works in our builds. I should probably check, but you know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's not something I've ever noticed, let's put it that way. Uh, so great, so we have a build, but all we've, like we haven't done anything special here, like nothing new, right? So, um, so, oh, uh, and right at the beginning I said we, we were uh, providing test data to Circle. So we ran one test, no failures. The slowest test was, well, the only one we ran. Um, great. So git tag. So we decide this is version one. We're releasing. Everybody good? Yeah? All right. Git tag uh, release dash 1.0.0. <laughs> Get those back ticks can't ship. <laughs> Actually, on that note, have, have you been able? Uh, do you know if there's a way to get the build to fail on Circle CI? If either uh, either cover all or the other thing that you showed, these back ticks detect it, right? Not, uh, I haven't looked into it, so I don't know. Um, it's an interesting question. Well, it just uses something in, like it, like the coveralls was using, like, uh, not Jacoco, the other one. Covertura, Covertura yeah. yeah. So, so you could put the rules into Covertura. Yeah. Um, but like co uh, the uh, Codacity or whatever the hell, the, other, the yeah. static analysis yeah. tool, for example. I'm not sure. I, I, so if I remember correctly, at least coveralls had, at some point, uh, you could integrate it into the GitHub project. I should say, I, I'm not 100% sure. It's either coveralls or CodeCov, because I've used both. But one of the two of them could be integrated into the GitHub project. And it, what it would do is if, if you had a PR, it would actually comment on the PR the, the results of that analysis. And so you could use that to decide not to merge the PR, for example. Um, but I'm not sure. It's a good question, though. Um, then this would, f the build would fail and therefore it wouldn't do things. Correct, Correct. yeah, absolutely. Uh, but if your test coverage is insufficient, it won't prevent anything yet. Um. Ah, oh, it's already done. Okay, so here you'll note, so this is the list of sort of builds that have happened and these two are the last one from my last push, okay? And so the first one you can see the step was build and then the second one, the step was deploy. And it says it's green, so why don't we go have a look here. So we've got hello tjug, our package in, and hey, we've got version one of our package is now available, <laughs> and you can use it as you see fit, because <laughs> everyone needs a hello world that's just a straight copy of the Maven archetype. Oh, uh, I want to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, how are we? So we've got a bit of time left. Um, that's all I have prepared. Actually, let me, before I say that, there's a few. So that's, we talked about bin tray. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so a few other things. I guess I can show some of these. I, I, I haven't done the integration for read the docs. I, I actually had just heard of it yesterday, and I want to have a look at it because it looks neat. But uh, read the docs is a, a document hosting service of some sort. Uh, so if you're doing open source software, please write documentation, please. <laughs> no, really, please. Uh, Waffle.io. Uh, so Waffle.io uh, gives you like the agile board style interface, but the data store it uses is GitHub issues. And so that's kind of nice if you're looking for that type of workflow. Uh, I'm 
I'm not a minimalist when it comes to ticketing, so I actually kind of prefer just having open, closed, done, I'm, I, that's it, right? But if, you're, if you like having sort of different states and work in progress and that sort of thing, it's there. It's, it's, uh, and again, it's free for open source projects. I can actually, I'll show you guys. Uh, waffle.io. And again, there are others like this. This just happens to be the one that I've played a little bit with. I won't even bother creating the, the new project. Um, so you can add issues. You can, well, let's add one. Uh, make the project suck less. Okay. And so we've got we've got a project, or you know, it's it's that's that's good enough. That's enough detail. We don't we don't really need more than that, right? Um, and then you can go in progress and, and eventually done. And you can customize these so you can add different uh, different columns. There's a bunch of other magic you can do in here that I kind of glanced at and said that's okay. I hate Jira and I don't want to make GitHub any more like Jira for me personally. But to each their own. Um, and so that's Waffle. Uh, again, read the docs. I just haven't dug into very much. Uh, yeah. So any questions, comments, stuff you guys have used and liked or didn't? No? 